In today's episode, we have a discussion with David Johnston, a professional full-time landscape photographer, YouTube content creator, and fellow podcast host from Nashville, Tennessee. David's career as a landscape photographer has spanned over a decade as he has made online tutorial-based courses about creating compelling photographs in the field as well as in post-processing. He also regularly hosts workshops and speaking engagements. David's work has been featured by The Nature Conservancy, Visual Wilderness, Outdoor Photography Guide, Digital Photography School, and Nature First. Please make sure to check out our show notes at the end of the show and to follow us on Instagram at All Outdoors Photography Podcast. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to episode 20 of the All Outdoors Photography Podcast, and we've got a very special guest today. Yeah, we have uh, David Johnson on the show. Uh, welcome, David. Um, so if you just want to start, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are, uh, where you're from, and what you do. Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, like you said, my name is David Johnston. I live in West Tennessee. I was born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, and um, I'm a professional landscape photographer. Some might say outdoor photographer, kind of just dabble in anything that has to do with the outdoors or you know, wildlife, macro, abstract, landscape type anything. Anything that tickles my fancy outside. <laughs> so you, are you a full-time photographer or part-time? Or? I am. I, I am a full-time photographer, um, although I could be labeled like a podcaster. I could be labeled a uh, videographer since I do a lot of video work and video content to earn an income in photography because it's as it's starting to, to look in the photography industry, you really have to know how to creative video um, more and more, especially with the budding of YouTube and how that can be used for photography vlogs and the outdoors um, and also the educational side. A lot is moving towards um, online tutorials that people can watch on their own time and stream and download on their own. For That's sure. Yeah. It's been a very big part of the with the uh, the pandemic. I feel like distance learning has become very crucial to not just photography, but you know a lot of things in education. So, do you feel like that really kind of adds to your business? I would say. I, I think it does, but I think it comes with an asterisk or a caveat to that, and you have to remain consistent with that once the pandemic is over, and we're already seeing a little bit of a fall off on the amount of consistency or repetition that people are having once they did introduce that as a part of their business during the pandemic. Sure, I'm guilty of that too, you know, really ramping projects up that are online driven and educational resources for photographers. You know, I had the goal of doing one per month. I made that through about two months and then dropped off significantly. <laughs> but um <laughs> Not only like online learning resources, but I don't know if you guys saw it. Um, you had a lot of people doing Instagram lives with other photographers and collaborating that way. It was like every time you open your Instagram, you would have those little live bubbles like completely atop the crop, the top of your screen. Um and not so much anymore. You know, it's kind of rare that those come up now. So I think it's all about. Now, once the pandemic is concluding, hopefully, um, we'll put an asterisk and a caveat on that too, but how consistent are you with it once that's over and will the industry continue to move in that direction once it's over or will it shift back to more in-person education? Would you say you personally, like, can you see yourself going more local kind of in-person activities or do you think you'll just kind of stay on the online course? You know, I, I think I'm going to stay on the online route. Uh, um, that matches with my lifestyle a little bit more and how I want to organize not only personal time, family time, but also finances as well. It allows me to work with a lot more people than I originally did uh, when I first started in photography for sure. So I think I'll probably continue going that route and, and see where it goes as long as it moves that direction. Now, with that being said, um, I'm also very focused on 
what else is starting to come up possibly in terms of video content. Uh, Henry, I know you do some video content too in terms of podcasting, like both of you are familiar with, you know, what's the next thing in that and how can you try to get ahead of the curve in terms of education uh, because that's such a big part of earning an income with outdoor photography. Okay. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Allow me to backpedal a little bit, but um, were you doing these online kind of courses and educational materials before the pandemic or was it something you started up? Yeah, I was. Uh, I was doing it beforehand. I was just doing a little bit less of them. I was making a lot of like one-time use videos that people could use. Like they would hire me as a contractor to produce this video for them. Uh, in terms of the coursework, I saw an increase for it on for my own website and not so much for contracting work with other people. So that's the kind of route that I would like to, to continue to take. Um, is there more risk with that? Of course, because you're not getting paid up front or you're not being paid uh, uh, royalty percentages with somebody that you know has a strong audience base. So there's always risk reward with those type of decisions. It's just how you want how you want to see your career going, you know, five, 10 years down the road and working towards that, uh, I think is really the goal for me. That's very nice. Yeah. I can imagine it's in a way it's almost easier because you can do it from your home. You don't really have to be out on location. You can be just make the course from your computer. Is that right? Exactly. And, and that's, that's one of the reasons that I want to stay on that route, Ryan, um, is the fact that, when I was starting out in photography, of course, I loved to travel and I loved to go all these places. But the more years I continued to do it, um, the more I found myself saying in the tent that I was sleeping in and the freezing cold or the back of the car that I was, you know, curled up in, in a sleeping bag and like a dingy hotel that some sketchy stuff <laughs> could go down at any second. Um, I was just in the back of my mind like, I could, you know, I would much rather be home right now. I'd much rather be with my wife. Uh, I have our first daughter now that, that I have to think about in terms of family time. So for me, I still love to go places, but when I do go, I, I primarily want to do photography while I'm there and do a lot of the work that I use to earn an income in photography when I am back home. Um, I want to enjoy my time while I am out traveling and then work when I'm home and, and also spend time with my family when I'm home too. Yeah. I feel like that a good like balance of kind of creating content with photography and just doing photography itself is very important. Do you ever find yourself say, if you're out in the field, I know you do like photo vlogs. Do you find your photography lessens a bit when you're out doing the vlogs um, like, do you feel pressured or anything? Or? Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, it, it happens for sure. Especially when you go out and you are thinking of a final result in mind, or maybe you've done like a, a general YouTube search and you know that this topic hits really well on search engine optimization, or, you know, you know, a lot of people have interests and in whatever you're going to hopefully get the photo of if you try to force yourself into that little corner typically i find that you come away really really disappointed so instead of doing a lot in terms of that strategy i've moved over a lot into just the vlogging like whatever happens happens um, and i really focus on the photography first so just a general example, you know, this last trip that I went to the Smokies, Smoky Mountains for, I spent all day just shooting um, and I filmed all of the talking portions of what I was maybe sharing some tips about after the fact in terms of the, of the photos that I was capturing or doing voiceover of what I actually shot um, in the field. So I'm trying to get around that after discovering um, 
that problem. And, and it, it really came up. I was talking after one of the podcast episodes that I did for my show, I was talking with uh, Sarah Lindsay and, and we were both kind of commiserating about the fact that your photography does take a step back a lot of times when you go into it with a strong focus on the video and, and sharing a lot of tips and hoping that your video is going to hit really hard with a lot of people. Um, so I, I've been... I've been aware of that, but, you know, it is still something that I do struggle with whenever I do go out in the field. And sometimes, you know, if it feels right and, and I'm in the creative flow on things, I just won't film a video, which is also very hard to do um, because I do think that some good could come out of it. But the enjoyment of photography is what I love so much, not necessarily all the video work that goes into it. Yeah, I've noticed that with um, quite a few of your videos is that you do kind of talk, you touch upon briefly that there is that balance you have to strike where it's like you want to get the nice photograph, but you also have to make a video with a nice strong narrative to go along with it. And to juggle all that, you know, at once just by yourself is, you know, it's quite a daunting task, really. So would you say that, you know, the video making influences your photography for the good or the better or the worse? What do you think? You know, I thought you were talking about like, I've noticed that with your videos, like your photos really suck at the end of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, I know what you're saying. Um, so I, I think it's kind of a double edged sword, Ryan, um, in terms of talking through a composition helps me see more compositions talking through a photo edit without ever looking at it before helps me usually edit better photos. Um, so I think talking through things in, in my own head and, and thinking out loud helps me, but in terms of being rushed and thinking about, you know, B roll whenever I am, am out filming videos really makes me lazy in terms of photography because I'm constantly, you know, I take two tripods out every single time I go three cameras, uh, wow. juggling all these different <laughs> lenses at the same time. So it, it's not like if I see a very small intimate scene in a forest that I'm like, maybe the shot will work out. Maybe it won't. I don't really know. Um, if I've been out shooting video all day and, like juggling tripods and cameras, I'm going to be much less inclined to put my camera bag down again and get my tripod out only to, to possibly discover that that photo isn't going to work out. And I don't really like what I see through my lens. Um, so again, you know, to answer your question, it, it is a double edged sword and it's one of kind of a balancing act that I think a lot of uh, YouTubers face when they do go out and film in the field. And that's something I really like about your videos. Um, you don't try to like almost like glorify photography. You, you're you honest about it. You, you know, some, some photographers will make videos frequently and just, you know, only show the good shots and, you know, not saying you take bad shots or anything, but you know, just you, I you're do, honest. <laughs> I, I, I really like your, I really like your honesty about everything. Cause especially for new photographers, um, they can be really disheartened, you know, when they're watching their favorite YouTubers and they see these glorious images, um, they can be really disheartened, but th they don't realize that professional photographers, they, they take bad shots sometimes too. And you just got to work through it. Yeah. And to that point, Henry, I think uh, one of the things that comes in is especially if you're going somewhere for the very first time, you're probably going to have way more fails or photos that you're not so happy with uh, than photos that you're thrilled with. I mean, I think after you're, after the fact of the trip, you know, once you get home, you're, you're fascinated and you're still in love with the place and you love every single photo you get remove yourself three months from that and you look back at those images and you're like, hmm, I could really improve that composition by moving over, you know, three feet this way. And I wish I would have seen that in the field. So I think not to beat yourself up about the photos that you get when, when you do go out, especially going to a place that for the first time, um, 
I think you should always do a self check afterwards and maybe even um, make plans to revisit a place multiple times. Uh, And I think the pandemic, you know, we talked about the pandemic a little bit. I think the pandemic has given us time to do that of discovering more local places and going to those over and over again and really discovering the compositions that are there instead of just the basic shots that you pull up and shoot at eye level. For sure. So, so you talked about your local area. Uh, would you mind real quick kind of mentioning the area you shoot in and kind of the opportunities that you've got there? Uh, yeah, I think it's, I think there are two real places. So I go to great smoky mountains national park about two to three times per year. Um, very familiar with that park and the area. Obviously there are a lot of different places in it that I have yet to explore and find. Um, but that's why I love going back. I, um, just really enjoy it because it's so diverse in what you can find there and the weather can change on a dime, especially, uh, up in the higher elevations of the mountains. Um, in terms of more locally, like let's say an hour and a half to two hours outside of where I live in my house, I have places like, um, cypress tree swamps, uh, places, you know, that are, are rolling hills of wheat that aren't as spectacular as what you get out in Washington, but there are some cool, uh, like highlight and shadow types of shots that you can get out there. Um, so that's kind of, kind of where I dive into. And more recently I've been getting into time-lapse photography when the summer storms pop up over in my area. Uh, I like to go out and, and shoot time lapses of those storms. So since you've been, you said you're based out of West Tennessee, I believe. And so have you been shooting there all your life or at least you're about a decades or so now of photography? Um, no. And, and it's, it's funny since I did move to West Tennessee, um, it, it's been a real learning curve for me to shoot in this place and, and kind of some of the local locations because you really have to search for them. Um, there are a couple state parks that are pretty obvious, but a lot of the other ones you really have to like, just be like, okay, here's a gravel road that looks promising. Let me just drive down this for the next 30 minutes and see if I can find anything. Um, so I've had a lot of just days of going out and driving aimlessly and just scouting around to see what I can find and get an idea of where the sun's going to be during certain parts of the year. Can I see the Milky Way there? Um, Where's the, you know, is this going to be a a good shot for winter photography or fall photography? So it's opened a new door and a new learning curve for scouting for me in terms of really planning out shots into the um, far future and, really pouncing on on the opportunities when that when those conditions come together and I can get out to those places. But I, I'm really more familiar with East Tennessee than I am West Tennessee. So it has been a big learning curve for me, Ryan. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, you're, you're just mentioning a little bit ago about the uh, the Great Smoky Mountains. And you said you only go there about two or three times a year. And I'm kind of surprised because um, a lot of your videos seem to be when they're on location. Uh, seem to be from that place. So that seems really like a really small number of like visits to go there per year. Um, is there any reason why? Why it's so small? Yeah. Yeah. Why you seem to go there so seldomly? I think it's just cause I'm lazy. Like it's a five hour drive and I don't necessarily oh. want to drive five hours. <laughs> I don't blame you. That's fair that's enough. Drive. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, are there any like super close locations that you can just jump over to on like a just a free couple hours that you can go to nearby? Yeah, absolutely. There are several mm-hmm. of those uh, around me. Like I mentioned, a lot of the random cypress groves that I've found, um, you know, I'll just, like I said, drive down a gravel road and find like a lone tree in the middle of a field and know, hey, if a storm ever pops up, you know, this could be a really cool shot to have in the foreground. Uh, a lot of different places like that. It's just, 
having the chance when those conditions do come together to, to get out and shoot those. So it, it's a lot of planning yes, for, for opportunities sure. and also planning for like years down the road. I think patience is really important too in those situations. Like you said, finding the tree and maybe not immediately photographing it, but kind of marking it in your head so you know to come back there when the conditions are right. Yeah, it's torture too because when you see it, you're <laughs> like, man, this is going to be such a cool shot because you can envision it in your mind, but at the same time, you're like, oh, why can't I just do it now? <laughs> <laughs> For sure, yeah. I've noticed that too. Yeah, it's like with the local spots, you kind of, like we said, get more familiar with them over time. And um, something I've been doing recently is just, yeah, the more often I go to a place that's a few minutes drive from my house is that, you know, I'll see shots like you're saying. And um, I feel like patience is just the best part because you, the best photographs really come from that patience because, you know, not everything comes to us like the best, you know, lighting conditions and all that. So tell us a little bit more about like your creative process, maybe like what are you exactly looking for when you're out in the field? Man, that's a, that's a good question. Um, like what's the first the, things you see, would you say? First things I usually see are the obvious shot. Um, so I will get to a place and go to the most popular locations. I have no problem with that. And taking, you know, the same compositions that people over and over have shot to death. Um, and those are fun to do because those are the places that you've seen and, and why you fell in love or wanted to go visit a place and, and to see them for yourself. You know, the, the one that comes to mind is in Grand Teton National Park. I remember standing behind the plaque of the famous Ansel Adams shot of the Teton Mountain Range with Snake River in the foreground. And I was just standing there thinking, like, how cool is this? Like to stand in the same place that an icon stood in and photographed the shot that's been done, you know, hundreds of thousands of times since that is such a cool feeling and, and such a cool experience um, for me personally. But then working from that and whittling down the composition is usually my creative process to photographing something in my own style. So taking taking that shot, then I can say, okay, what's the most interesting mountain peak here? Then I take a photograph of that mountain peak. Maybe I switch lenses and, and get a telephoto out and, and really hone in on just shooting a portrait of like the mountain face. And then thinking, if I came back here, you know, at sunset, what, what would it look like? Uh, would this have Alpenglow at sunrise? And thinking about different options for me, and if for my photography and those photographs that I really love the most um, that I work for are the ones that are so simple that have like one subject and maybe another complementary subject in them uh, that, that are much less obvious in the field because you have to whittle it down so much. Those are always my favorite photos. What you're describing, I've I've kind of, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I've kind of seen a general move kind of more towards that style. Uh, why do you think that is kind of the more intimate kind of landscapes? I think it's because people are tired of, of the same images they see on, on social media all the time. Um, and again, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with going to those locations and photographing them. Uh, I do it all the time, like I said, but I think it's just because people are tired of it. Um, the intimate shots that really make people look at a little bit longer and, and think about, well, what, what is this? Where is this photographed? Uh, and, and the ultimate question, you know, how did you get this shot? It really opens the door for conversation and not only conversation, but it opens the door for I think relationship for a lot of people and friendship and communication. And, you know, a lot of the photographers that I know, those same shots are the ones that jump out to me, the ones that they've been all over the globe or, or all over the Western United States, but a shot of like just a very small scene of snow falling in front of some Aspen trees that could be literally anywhere in the Rocky mountain chain uh, are usually the ones that, that really stand out to me. So I think it's just fatigue, really, uh, of the shots that you see over and over. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. Um, I feel like 
it can really allow you to develop your own style too as well. Um, kind of leading off of that, would you say you kind of have a style to your work besides the more intimate side of things? Um, like, would you put yourself in like a category or? I don't think so. Um, I jump around a lot to different things that interest me. Um, like I mentioned with time-lapse photography, you know, I've picked that up recently. I did a lot of it when I was first starting out and then got kind of bored with it and then picked it up here recently after learning some new techniques and, and how to shoot better time-lapses. But I think it's just the flavor of the month really with me is, you know, if I'm in a location that has a lot of waterfalls, I may trek and do waterfall photography for five days straight. If I'm in Death Valley National Park, um, you know, I'm going to do a lot of sand dune photography. I may that do that for five days straight and, you know, just work with the different highlights and shadows on things. I don't think that, if I go somewhere, I have a lot of similar looking shots than other locations. Um, and maybe that's just in terms of location to location as well. Uh, I don't really know. I've never really thought of that before, Henry, but um, gives me something to ponder, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so say you're out in the field. Um, are you kind of one of those landscape photographers that will wait for one shot like they set up their tripod and they're they're waiting for the light to catch for you know hours on end or are you kind of a more mobile landscape photographer that's kind of moving around and getting multiple different shots i like to be a little bit more mobile um i may i may have a shot in mind uh, of some place that i want to go that that really captures that location but for the most part you know, we'll use Great Smoky Mountains as an example. Since I'm familiar with it, I may want to go to a certain high elevation waterfall or an overlook. But on the way there, I want to capture, you know, everything I see around me, um, which really brings in a lot of the other genres or, or subcategories of landscape photography and, and even some adventure photography. If I'm going and hiking with some friends, you know, I'll shoot them as they're hiking through the woods. And I'm usually the one that's lagging behind the rest of the group holding everybody up. But um, <laughs> I really like I really like that experience more than you know, I, I have this shot in mind and I'm just going to go there really fast and, and wait on the light to be just right when I get there. Cause I have no idea what the light is going to do. Oftentimes, um, I have no idea if a cloud bank is going to come in on the horizon and completely occlude everything. Uh, and then I waited there for nothing and kind of missed out on not only the other photographs I could have gotten, but the overall experience and enjoyment of just being outside. I've been on both sides of the coin, kind of like what you're saying, where I've gone out with a predestined kind of idea of an image in mind. And you get lucky sometimes and the light hits just right and everything works out and that's great. Um, but I'm definitely much more with the more reactive side, I will say, of just going out and seeing what the conditions are and reacting accordingly with the camera. Yeah, Ryan, I'll, I'll give you an example. In, in that same shot, I was talking about the, the Teton shot where Ansel photographed. Um, I noticed just the range in front of me and how cool it would look at sunrise because you would get that warm glow on the mountains. And, and I came back the next morning and I was photographing and I was like, I'm just going to wait on everything to kind of come together because I had this composition in mind. Um, and as I waited, you know, the fog continued to roll into the valley and it completely covered up everything that I was photographing. And I noticed up the road a good bit that the fog was clearing up that direction, but the sun was like getting really close to the horizon line. So I sprinted back to my car and jumped in, <clears throat> threw my camera in the back seat and drove up to the next parking lot. And when I got there, I grabbed my camera, jumped out, ran up to the edge of where you can stand for the overlook 
And literally as this, at the same time that I'm coming up to that edge, a big elk comes up over that as well. And we almost collide and hit each other. Um, and, and like, I would have been like hospitalized cause that thing was enormous, but wow. you know, I got wow. the shot, I got my camera all set up and within, you know, 10 seconds, the photo was taken and then the sun came out and the shot was gone. Um, so that's kind of like gives you an idea of what I like to do and kind of the chase that I like to have when I am out, uh, for lack of a better term. Yeah, I feel like the pursuit of photos, for me at least, and you, you probably feel the same way, always kind of yields the best results. Or not even the pursuit, just kind of the, you're out there and what happens is what happens and um, just kind of reactionary, but still definitely intentional. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. So what, like, what would you say are your favorite techniques when you're out in the field? Do you prefer to do a lot more long exposures? Um, I don't know if you do any macro or anything of that sort of style um or do you like to do more telephoto landscapes wide angle like tell us a little bit more about your different techniques you use yeah i would definitely say that i start out in more of a telephoto look when i first get to a location or a place but the more i go there and the more i sit there and like i said whittle that composition down to something that's very simple Um, I've found myself using my telephoto lens more than any other lens that I have in my bag, just kind of picking out different things that, that make a place unique, um, is kind of the technique that I like to use. And not only that, um, in terms of, you know, I keep mentioning time-lapse. I do time-lapse sometimes when I'm sitting up there and and just watching everything come together. I may have two cameras running at once, one doing time-lapse and then one with my telephoto on it and and shooting what I see through that. Um, But macro is, is one that I've been a little bit interested in, but I've always been really bad at it. And I just recent, like I'm bad in the fact of focus stacking I can never be patient enough to get like every little minor detail within focus range. And one of the lenses that I just picked up is a lens baby macro lens. Um, And what it does is it puts this like ethereal effect on the outside of anything that you're focused on. Uh, And that's at the widest max aperture. Now the smaller the aperture um, ring and the opening that you go within the lens, the less ethereal effect that it has. So if you're photographing at like 1.8, you know, it's going to be really hazy and dreamy. Uh, if you're, if you're shooting at like F8, it's going to be much less. So, um, and, and that type of photography allows me to get around that problem that I always have in macro of not getting everything in the stack perfectly in focus so that it all comes together. Uh, The ethereal look and the dreamy look allows me to play around in in the editing process a lot too. So macro is definitely something that I've picked up recently and really been enjoying a lot more recently, especially with that lens. Um, Cause it, instead of doing like an entire flower, you know, you can focus on, just the edge of like a rose petal and everything else is, is this blurry dreamy mess uh, behind it that I've really found interesting and and fun to play around with, especially this fall with a lot of the fall color that's been on the trees. That's that's super cool. Um, Macro for sure is especially like during quarantine and stuff. It's, it's a good way even in your own backyard, you can get some decent um, photos and you can just, you know, you, you get the wides of the landscape, you can get in the telephotos, but why not go even smaller and, you know, capture the individual leaves of everything. So. For sure. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, and you can always be like the weird guy down like an inch away from a blade of grass that everyone's staring at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Too many and, times. You know, I, I've been out in like the yeah. middle of a trail. Yeah. And I get scared by some dog or something and they go, hello, you know, behind me. And I jump because yeah. I'm just knelt over. I look like a weirdo. I'm just knelt over 
we're looking at a flower on the ground. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I like how, I like how you're you're definitely a landscape photographer, but you don't try to limit yourself to a certain style. Like you don't try to do just wide angle shots or just telephoto. I like how you shoot a nice wide variety of things because I feel like people can get caught up in labels sometimes when you just definitely do not need to have those. So you know it. And that's, that's a, that's a funny point, Henry, because I was going through like a really difficult time in my creativity with photography and I was having like a lot of life changes. And, uh, I remember I talked to John Barclay, who's one of like, he's like a Zen master in photography. He's so wise, uh, uh, everything he says, I like hang on every word, but, um, he was we were talking about it and like some of my struggles and he was just like, if you just see something that you think is cool, just take a photograph. Like don't overthink it too much. If you just see something that interests you, whether it's light or subject or anything like that, just take the photograph. Um, and that's really what helped me a lot when I was coming out of that creative slump, um, and really struggled to, take any photos really that, that I found interesting. So yeah, I credit John with, with a lot of, of what I do in terms of versatility and photography. To build upon that, um, one of my favorite phrases is uh, photographing democratically. So it's, or it just means, you know, the Grand Tetons would be like a very big deal, of course, but it's just as important to me with the camera as like a leaf on the ground, you know, on like a busy street. It's like the same thing to me in that sense. A hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. And I think if you take that approach and, and you put that much work into really every type of photograph that you take or every location that you're shooting in, you know, you're going to have a lot more fun in photography. It's always fun to go on a trip and see a new place. It's always fun to experience a new culture or something like that. But, you know, is it always fun to go to the same trail in your hometown that you've been to 20, 25 times before. If the answer is no, and you're not really finding anything new, I, maybe you need to like do a double check on, on what you're doing when you are out there. Are you upset that you're not going to a new location or like an epic place that you've seen on Instagram? Um, or are you just happy to be outside with a camera? I think that enjoyment and that natural love for it is uh, directly correlated with creativity and, and good photos. On the topic of creativity, do you ever find yourself, like, I guess you could say challenging yourself? Do you ever just go out with a lens and just a camera body and see what happens? Or do you like to be more like formulaic and more thought out with your uh, going out in the field, let's say, with your trips? I'll, I'll limit myself sometimes for sure, Ryan. Um, it's rare if I do, uh, but I will limit myself in that way sometimes. One idea that I've had recently is... Um, my parents recently found my first film camera at their house and I've been thinking about trying to use it and trying to see if I can get anything good with that. Cause it was like, man, that had, that was like 20 years ago now. So wow. do I still remember that? I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like film is a good way to kind of get back to the roots of photography, strip away kind of all the electronic elements and just really focus on the scene itself. Yeah. Um, and I have so much respect for anybody who does shoot film. Um, yes. That is like, that is not something that I would ever want to take on full time. Digital photography is hard enough. I, I can't even imagine. Yeah, yeah really. <laughs> For sure. And kind of, kind of leading off of that, um, we've got a good amount of uh, like gear fans on this show, like mm -hmm. listeners, and and me, I'm a pretty big gear fan myself. So, uh, if you could just briefly touch on some of the gear you use to capture your shots. Yeah, and my my bag has really changed a lot this year. Um, it's kind of taken a huge overhaul from the beginning of the year. So. Right now, I'm using a Sony a7R II. Um, primarily, my wide-angle lens that I'm using is a Tamron 17-28 f2.8 lens. 
Um, just an awesome lens for that camera in particular. I've also been using the Tamron 70 to 300 f 4.5 to 6.3. I have a 70 to 200 f 4 from Sony that I use sometimes if I'm shooting like two telephotos at the same time, you know, I can double up those lenses uh, and shoot with two cameras and, and get kind of double the shots that I get from a location or use two techniques at once. Um, in terms of anything else, you know, I still shoot with my old a 6,000 and my broken on 12 millimeter, especially for night photography. That's still a great setup for me. Um, but primarily that's kind of where my bag is. I don't, and my, my lens baby lens that, that I talked about just a second ago, um, it's kind of what I'm taking. It's, it's more than I'm used to with gear. Cause I used to limit myself and, and Ryan, this kind of goes with your question just a second ago. You know, I used to only take my 70 to 200 and my 12 millimeter out with me when I had my a 6,000, that's all I was shooting with. Uh, but it seems like upgrading to a full frame has also upgraded my lenses and, and more than doubled those and, and really weighed down my bag, which uh, can be a big burden sometimes. Sure. Um, when a lot of people in landscape photography uh, will use filters, polarizers, NDs, do you find yourself using those frequently? <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll, I use polarizers a lot, especially for, for waterfall photography. You know, those are a must have and visiting the Smoky Mountains so much as I do. Um, I, I have to have one of those in my bag. Um, not only there, but like some waterfalls around Nashville that are a little bit closer. You know, I visit those several times a year and try to get new shots and compositions there. Uh, and, and a polarizer is just a must have for me. I, th I think that is necessary. Uh, recently, I've been using a Nisi polarizer. I had used a Heda polarizer in the past, um, but I like the Nisi and, and what it allows me to do. And then um, I do some long exposure stuff. It's very rare that I do uh, with some uh, ND filters, but grad ND filters, I do not use in the field. I do all grad ND and post-processing. Awesome. Yeah, that's fair. And if you wouldn't mind, um, kind of what editing software are you using and kind of what your post-processing workflow is after you get back from the field? It depends. Um, a lot of times, you know, I will just take the Lightroom and Photoshop route. I have dabbled in Luminar uh, and I, I do know how to use that software a lot. I just worry the direction that they're going and, and what they're trying to push in terms of like sky replacement and um, artificial intelligence within their software. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of that. Not that there's anything wrong with people who do like that type of thing. Um, that's just not in my wheelhouse or something that I'm too interested in, but the Lightroom and Photoshop, you know, there, there's so much you can learn in Photoshop. It seems like every single time, maybe you jump on YouTube and you see a different way. Another photographer does the same technique can be a little bit, a bit of a tweak to your creativity and post-processing and, and kind of overall improve your photography. And, and like I said, I, I've seen a ton of just improvement and maybe I should do this every single time I edit an image, but doing like a live edit for filming a YouTube video all every single time I like the live edit. I do way more than if I spend hours and hours trying to figure out what it's going to look like in the end. Um, so that's kind of like my workflow and, and post-processing. Awesome. Uh, Kind of on the subject of artificial intelligence, um, do you think that dilutes photography like as a art form or do you think it could still have some benefits? You know, I don't think it dilutes photography. I think it dilutes the trust that the public has with photography. Um, because if you show somebody an image that has obviously been touched up a little bit in Lightroom or Photoshop, the first question that they're going to have is like, what was that edited or was that photoshopped? And photoshopped has almost become like a verb in our vocabulary of 
for, for, for correlation or, or similarity with fake. Um, and I think that gives photography a really bad rap. And I think continuing to move that direction and go down that road is an extremely slippery slope. And I think it's very, it's very dangerous for the public's opinion on photography in general. Now, do I think that you can create amazing images with artificial intelligence tools? Yes. Do I think that they help speed up the process in terms of using something like, let's take in Luminar, the AI accent tool or their artificial intelligent accent tool. You're able to do multiple edits to one image at one time and you're not pulling out like a sky from Namibia and putting it into an, a foreground from Tennessee, you know, something completely <laughs> obscene and ridiculous. Um, so I think it has its benefits in some ways, but the direction that it's going with artificial intelligence to just, uh, I don't want to use the term lie, but it's just, it's not true. It's not honest. Um, and I, I have a real problem with it. And I know that using that word, it might give me some, you know, pushback from people. But for the most part, I think if you're honest, whenever you do share an image, say that it is like, uh, you know, an artistic creation instead of a photograph, I, I think that would help. But overall, it, it's just, it's giving photography a really bad rap. And, and I have a big problem with it. I'm in a similar boat as you, David. Um, I've been using Skylum since uh, Luminar 2018. And it's I, I agree with you where it's like the direction they're, the company's going in as a whole is very questionable, to say the least. Um, but I, I continue to still use the software just for you know minor adjustments to my photos, global sliders and such. But um, would you argue that the, like, let's say the sky replacement, does that cheapen the overall photography process? Or would you just consider that arts as long as they're upfront about that? As long as they're upfront about it, I would still say that it's art, um, depending on the photographer. Now, like I said, if they were trying to push it as a photograph, um, I have a problem with that. I would say it remains, ah, this is such a difficult conversation. It remains, <laughs> it remains a photograph. I think if you do something like have the foreground shot, and then shoot a long exposure sky like an hour later to get the right light and exposure that you want and then blend those two together. But like I said, if you're pushing two locations into the same image, that that's when it gets really messy for me. I would, I would say there's more expertise with what you're saying. Like exposure blending takes a lot more skill and process, but like the AI sky replacement tool, you just click a slider and it does the magic for you. So there's definitely, I feel like a clear, you know, difference between the two. And I think it, it, it cheapens your connection to the image. Um, because if you spend so much time working on something, you're really, really proud of it. And you really love how it turned out. If you just click a button, like you said, and a new sky just pops in from anywheresville in the United States, um, then you're just like, Hey, cool photo, cool result. Uh, and then move on with your life. But again, you know, like you said, Ryan, Skylum software is good in terms of the fact that you can do a lot of those edits to your images. You can put layers on top of one another. You can do luminosity masking in it. All that is fantastic. But I, I would dare say if they continue to go down the road that they do, I would definitely jump ship on that. Yeah, I, I feel like I feel like they probably will. Unfortunately, I don't know if you've seen this on social media, but at least I've seen a push towards like the crazy sky images, the replacements, super saturated colors, just pretty much like images that you could never really capture in one frame, like showing up all over Instagram. And sadly, well, I don't know if this is necessarily a bad thing, but they seem to get the the most likes. So, do you ever find yourself pressured to go that direction, or? I, I don't have pressure to go that direction. The pressure comes in is when whether or not I should call them out for it. And I don't know which approach I should take on it because 
I have in the past and doing it in like a really nice way when their post was an absolute blatant lie. Um, I have messaged somebody before and been like, come on, man, like you can't, you can't do that. Um, and it, it usually gets into some pretty heated waters pretty quickly. So I should probably just stay out of it and ignore it. <laughs> it's good on you for doing that at least. Cause a lot of people I feel like would be quite afraid to say the least, just to call someone out on their bluff and to say that they're lying. You know, a lot of people don't have that, you know, that type of spine, I guess, to really say it to them. Well, it, what it was is what it was, a, uh, a shot of downtown Nashville and it had a Milky Way behind it. And I was like, dude, <laughs> this is literally impossible. You cannot do this. And I think, I think another one had, um, had like a moon or something in the same shot. And I was like, you can't even see the Milky Way with a full moon out. So this is like, again, literally impossible for you to create. This. <laughs> yeah, that, that almost calls back to that great debate over that Peter Lick photo. I don't know if you've heard about it. The one where the moon's like over the mountain yeah. like perfectly. And there's huge debate on that on the internet. Yeah, it's just so much more fun to me to to try to get an image naturally like that and and just uh -huh. play with what I have there. If a full moon is setting or rising over a mountain, you know, I'm not going to click it and move it over into a different part of the sky. Now, there is some wiggle room or gray area if you're doing like a um let's say a lunar eclipse sequence over a night like a night sky and you have one foreground, that's a little bit different. And obviously when you post it, you're like, this is multiple frames, you know, shot in different sequences as the full moon becomes eclipsed. Um, so I think there's some gray area there too, but, but obviously it becomes a very slippery slope. For sure. And you know, you're doing natural photography. So the goal of a photographer is to capture the nature around them. You know, sometimes I feel like the, some photographies almost become more like graphic design in a way. So you kind of got to recognize the difference between that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's a great point. If you don't mind, uh, let's go ahead and move on to something else here. Um, another thing I wanted to unpack here is maybe about your, your business side. Cause I know you're full time with your landscape photography. Um, and you've been doing about 10 years, I believe. Um, what would you say has been attributing to, um, let's say your success and to keep you doing this? Um, I think having long-term goals in mind, uh, and not living so much year to year. And when I say that it, it's, it's something that I constantly have to remind myself of and maybe get feedback from my wife on sometimes too, and have her get me a little bit more grounded on if I'm spiraling out of control and be like, is this actually feasible to do for the rest of my life? Like, you know, I had a really bad month and finances. Um, when, when that happens, it really helps to have a long-term goal in mind. And, and, you know, one of the things, Ryan, that I've always kept with me is uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Gary Vaynerchuk and how he communicates to people who want to be entrepreneurs and have their own business or just do what they love to do, however much they want to do it. And I remember a long time ago, an interview I was watching with him and they were doing an interview in the back of a car and someone ran up to the car window and knocked on it and he rolled down the window and they said, Gary V, give me, you know, one tip of advice to live by for the rest of my life. And he looked them dead in the eye and he said, you're going to die. And I was like in shock that he said that, but he later explained like regret is something that you never want to live with. And if you really enjoy doing something, whether that be part-time or just as a hobby, like go ahead and tackle it head on. Because when you talk to people and they have that regret, maybe they're getting to the end of their life um, that we're all going to reach at some point. And you have that regret of like, what if I never tried this? Um, that just like eats away at me all the time. 
if I'm afraid of, of trying a new project or starting something new, like when I started the Landscape Photography Show podcast, you know, I had a podcast a long time ago uh, and I quit it. I, I stopped doing it because I wasn't enjoying it anymore. And I was afraid to start this new one because I was afraid that that same thing was going to happen again. And maybe it will, who knows? But I, I always think about that answer whenever I'm going to start something new or whenever, you know, I feel afraid about sharing something in the, in a video that's going on in my personal life or like a failed photo that I got. Um, that's something that I always carry with me. Long-term goals, patience, uh, consistency, I think is a huge one for me and diligence. Uh, and just knowing like, I don't want to have regrets uh, at the end of my life. I can I can attest to you, David. Um, Gary Vee is definitely a big influence on my work um, in the same way as you, where just entrepreneurship and just personal motivation to just keep doing what you're doing. Um, is there any other inspirations, photographers or otherwise, that you really look up to? Uh, John Barclay, I uh, mentioned him, is a big one. Uh, other people like Josh Cripps have been instrumental, not only in giving me advice for the business side of photography, but he's always been uh, someone who's great about sharing his time and, you know, talking back and forth uh, about photography or, or life in general. Um Let's see other people, Sarah Marino and her husband, uh, Ron have been great. Ron's not doing photography anymore, but Sarah still is. And, uh, I check in with them several times throughout the year and, and talk to them about projects, uh, that come up, but, you know, those would probably be big ones for me, um, in terms of, I think just like friendships and relationships that I've built in photography and just talking with people. Dusty Doddridge is a good friend of mine. We go out and photograph um, in Tennessee and the surrounding states several times a year. And, and he's always somebody that is literally like a kid at heart. He's, I don't even know how old he is, to be honest. I probably should, but he's way younger than me and, and his energy level and his exuberance for life. Um, so all those people are, are people who feed into me and, and help me keep going in photography um, and keep continue to be uh, inspired by it. Awesome. So here on the show, um, we always like to give a little bit of beginner tips to our audience who may be listening. So do you have a couple beginner tips? Who man. See, this is where it becomes a problem when I'm like, don't tell me what we're going to talk about. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, beginner tips. I would say don't get into photography and only have your wide angle lens connected to your camera. I would say really explore using a telephoto lens a lot when you're first starting out um, because you don't want that experience to come in later on down the road and think about all the shots that you could have gotten when you were just using a wide angle lens. Um, I would say what my friend John Barclay said to me, just if you see something interesting, photograph it. I would say on the business side, if it's really something that you want to do, find somebody who will, who will help you and be a mentor to you and be somebody who will encourage you to keep going, but also somebody who will keep you in check and be like, Hey man, you were, or, uh, if any females are out there, um, not just guys, but, um, like you are way out of line there. Uh, I think people who can keep you in check and, and really help you with that is huge, especially in photography when there's so much, there's so much, um, like risk. There's so much, there's so much eating at you to say, if I could only get that much further into the landscape, I could get the good shot when there's a sign there that says keep out. That's like huge for me. You should never do it. But that temptation is always there in the back of your mind. So someone who's going to keep you in check with that stuff is really good. Um, so that would probably be my advice for anybody starting out. It's, it's definitely one large um, mental game. 
people, I feel like outsiders don't really understand how much think about like photography, like w when it becomes like as big as a, as big of a passion that all three of us have for it. You really, you think about it a lot and you can really get down on yourself and you got to kind of learn how to, you know, manage that. It's a mental game for sure. Mm -hmm. Especially if, you know, you put so much pressure on yourself going to a new place and trying to get that one shot that you've always wanted to get, um, being flexible and, and just working with what's right in front of you, uh, is huge. You know, there's, there's a saying that I always have, it's not, you won't find happiness in a future imagined or a past remembered. You'll find happiness and joy in the situation that you're in right now. Um, and it's something that helps me in photography and stay grounded and, and what I'm going through at the moment. For sure. sure. I can appreciate also how you really, I know it's like you in your t-shirts, you wear it in your videos, you're really much about the, like the ethical side of uh, nature photography, which I mean, a lot of people might look up to you as being a big name, which I would say you are of course, but they, they like to see that I think, and it helps teach them that, you know, care about the nature and the environment around them and not just photograph it only. Yeah, I, a lot of my shirts and the stuff that I get is from uh, Phil Monson's company, Adventure Responsibly, uh, and he makes some really cool stuff. Some of his stuff is really funny uh, that he creates, but he's, I mean, he himself is a, is a fantastic photographer too and somebody that I think we've built a friendship over Instagram and, and messaging back and forth too, and uh, his shirts are really comfortable. I'll go ahead and plug his company there. <laughs> It's, that sounds great. All right. Well, it's been a great conversation, David. Uh, where can people go to learn more about your work? Yeah, you can go to davidjohnstonart.com. Um, that's where you'll find all of my portfolios and my podcast and a lot of my videos too. You can search me, David Johnston Photography on YouTube and find me there too. And uh, that's probably the two main places that you can look for me. I think my Instagram handle is David Johnston photo. I'm not really sure to be honest. Um, probably we'll not. Have, we'll have all the links. We'll have all the links down below. So cool. if you guys want to check them out, make sure to go down there. Awesome. awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for your time, David. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks so thank much guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching the Owl Outdoors Photography Podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and the video version on YouTube as well. You can subscribe down below, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you.